Well, that's, that's really nice. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well done to you for battling through the fog and the ice and the snow and uh, all of that. Uh, great to see you. And if you're watching online, well done to you for getting up and sitting there in your Winnie the Pooh pajamas with hot chocolates. And uh, great to see you too. How many of you watched the game last night? Raise your hand if you did. Yes. Yeah. How many of you don't, couldn't care less, frankly? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, we will forgive the referee. Eventually. <laughs> so good to see you, always is. And we're continuing in this God Cares series. And uh, I'm asking a question of us today, and that is, what are, we, what are we doing for Christmas? What are we doing for Christmas? I'd like us to look at Luke chapter 2, familiar words um, around the whole nativity story. And then also consider a, a particular carol that we roll out this time of the year, Hark the Herald angels sing. And mingling between uh, the scripture text and that carol, I'd like us to consider what we're doing for Christmas. Luke chapter 2 verse 8 says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. And then the great carol written by Charles Wesley, the Methodist leader, back in 1739, the first verse familiar to us, Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. Joyful, all you nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn King. Well, Christmas takes a lot of preparation. Let's um, have a moment here. Can you um, raise your hand uh, if you uh, are all completely prepared for Christmas? The tree is up, the gifts have been purchased. Just raise your hand right now if that's true. Let's have a moment of smugness and frankly, rampant envy because there's only just a few of us. It takes a lot of preparation for Christmas. Do you know that in the UK, um, the average UK person gets through 7,000 calories just on Christmas Day? No wonder Henry VIII, it's rumoured back in 1538, made it law that you were not allowed to have puddings or mince pies on Christmas Day. He was obviously a bit of a misery in between wives or something, and he decided that he wanted to outlaw gluttony, which history suggests to us was medicine that he didn't particularly take himself. But can you imagine it being illegal to have a mince pie? Uh, and it's rumoured that it's still in, in, in law today. You know, a guy comes up to you and he says, do you want some stuff? And you go, what you got? He goes, I've got, I've got puff pastry. Meet me around the back. <laughs> and then the police show up and, and you've got a mince pie. And it's like, step away from the mince pie, sir. It really is crazy. It takes a lot of preparation for Christmas. And Advent is this season which we find ourselves in. The word Advent, it means coming. We celebrate the coming of Christ to this earth. We celebrate His coming to us when we invite Him to take charge of our lives. And we also celebrate the second Advent when He will come again. And in the last week or so, I've been asked two questions repeatedly over the last seven days. The first one um, has been, will England beat France? Well, that's been decisively answered in the last 24 hours. And the second one is, what are you doing for Christmas? It's kind of a conversation thing 
that we do. What are you doing for Christmas? And because God cares so, it's a question I'd like us to ponder together today. Because God cares, first of all, surely Christmas is a time to share the good news. It's a time to share the good news of Jesus. The news came to these shepherds who had, frankly, a really boring job. Their life was dull and predictable. They're out in the fields at night. Can you imagine it? You're just standing there watching sheep and Fred's got a notebook and Sid is watching out and Sid says, uh, number 43 is now chewing grass. (laughs) Number 27 is now sleeping. It's all very boring and predictable, but more than that, to be a shepherd was to be despised. When we read in Luke 15 that Jesus ate with sinners, the word sinner doesn't just mean naughty person. There was a category of occupation that was designated as sinful. And one of those uh, occupations was shepherding because shepherds were considered uh, disreputable. No one trusted them. They were infamous for sheep stealing. They took flocks onto land that didn't belong to them. Theirs was a boring, predictable and marginalised life when suddenly, after a 400-year gap of silence, news broke in of joy and meaning. Why is it so important that we invite people, that we perhaps offer this as a boarding pass to a renewed eternity? Why is that's so important? Is it, is it simply that we want to see more people in chairs in our buildings? Absolutely not. I think it's so vital that we understand that we are living in a culture that has lost the plot and so urgently, urgently needs the news. We are living in a quagmire, the quicksands of postmodern pluralist relativism. Postmodern means there's no core story to life. Pluralism, the idea that all roads lead to God. Relativism, whatever's true for you is true. Have you noticed how many people these days talk about, I need to share my truth, my truth. How many know today there's no such thing as my truth or your truth, there's only truth. Truth is not what I make it. Let me share my truth with you, Jeff's Truth, I absolutely believe that I am Brad Pitt's undiscovered twin. Thank you for your support. My truth doesn't make it true at all. And I also, have you noticed how many people are talking about the universe? Oh, the universe is speaking to me. I was chatting with somebody recently and he said, the universe is calling my name. Now, at one level, I rejoice at the possibility that that person is thinking that they, there might be something beyond them. It might be the first step towards realisation of the revelation of Christ. But if you stop at the idea of the universe, you remain lost because the universe makes no demands. It offers no relationship. It is whatever We want it to be. We end up, as Romans chapter one says, worshipping creation rather than the creator. We end up with a culture which is, as the poet T.S. Eliot said, a wasteland. And ironically, secular scholars have been telling us for decades about the lostness of our culture. When I was in high school back in 1762, I had to read George Orwell's 1984. Anyone read 1984? Raise your hand, feel scholarly as you do that, that's good. And then Huxley's Brave New World. Raise your hand if you had to read that in school. Quite a few of us, Orwell and Huxley. Orwell got it wrong and Huxley got it right. Orwell said the books would be banned. Huxley said there'd be no reason to ban a book. Orwell said we'd be deprived of information. Huxley said there'd be information overload. Orwell said truth would be concealed and Huxley said, listen to this, truth would be drowned in irrelevance. Orwell said we'd be a captive culture and Huxley said we'd be a trivial 
culture. And the irony of, of all of this, my brothers and sisters, is that we have this sense that we are so sophisticated. It was C.S. Lewis who described what he called chronological snobbery. The idea that because we live at the time that we do, we just know so much better. Our culture is lost. And this is a time for us to celebrate news of joy. The coming of Jesus, His life, His death, His resurrection, His forgiveness, even for nearsighted referees. <laughs> and I want to say that not only is this a time for us to invite people, but as they come among us, let's lift up the name of Jesus with joy and celebration. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, the tune for that, the words were written by Charles Wesley, the tune was written by Felix Mendelssohn. And when he wrote the tune, he said, this tune should never be used for sacred purposes by the church, for it's far too merry. In other words, he had this idea that we Christians really need to be a sad lot. And we don't celebrate and we don't lift up our voices and we are not joyful. It's so sad. Did you know that Mendelssohn actually wrote the tune to celebrate the invention of movable type printing by Johann Gutenberg? So when we sing this song every year, we're singing a tune which basically says, hooray, we can read books. But there are people waiting to hear the joyful news. I heard of a young man who was when he was 16, he was so lost and he went out on Christmas Eve with a bunch of his friends to get hopelessly drunk. And he, they determined that at midnight they were gonna find a Christmas service to disrupt. They were gonna throw beer bottles, empty ones, they drunk the contents at the church doors to disrupt the service. They got so drunk that they didn't manage to complete their mission. That young man was me. And within six months, I'd heard the joyful good news of Jesus. Someone said to me, why don't you come to church? And my life was changed. And that night, That night, some of you have heard me talk about it before. I met Jesus and then five minutes later, I met Kay. It was a pretty good night. <laughs> I was with a friend. I took him along for security. And Kay thought he was really cute. I'm over that. <laughs> but this young man, then 16, now not, so urgently needed. I was waiting to hear. Ecclesiastes chapter three and verse 11 says, God has put eternity in the hearts of humanity. Do we know that as we go out with these, as we go out with the smile and invitation, that the missional God has gone ahead of us and He has already put a sense of vacancy in the hearts of women and men and boys and girls. A sense that there is something new. That's why people are banging on about the universe. What a tremendous opportunity is ours. Let's share the good news. Secondly, God cares. And so this is a time to intentionally listen to the whispers of God, the whispers of God. Hark the herald. Hark is a word that means listen carefully, pay attention. There was trauma in the Lucas household in this last 10 days because I decided to try and fix something. We had a toilet that was running. How many know what I mean by that? A toilet that's running. You, it just, the water just keeps going, right? Sorry to mention the word toilet on a Sunday morning, but... Christians use them, so it's part of life. And Kay said, we need to call the plumber. And I said, Kay, fear not. Fear not. For I, J 
Jeffrey Lucas shall fix this toilet. And she nodded and smiled and then laughed nervously. <laughs> 10 hours later, spread over three days, 17 YouTube videos, a crick in my back, two trips to home base, a lot of unchristian muttering, and a small flood in the room beneath the toilet. <laughs> Finally, Hosanna, it was fixed. But two hours into that 10 hours, Kay said to me, honey, why don't you t tighten that nut before you put that gas you gasket thing? I was it gasket, gasket thing. <laughs> Fix it, I can't even pronounce it. And I said, darling, no, no. I am a graduate of YouTube University. <laughs> How tragic it is when we don't listen to each other. How tragic it is when we don't listen to God. And I've been discovering afresh in the last few weeks how life doesn't make sense unless we are people who listen to the whispers and the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word of the Lord changes everything. Karl Barth said, when we dig into scripture, we go into that strange new world within the Bible. And I believe more than ever in this lost world, not only do we need to talk to people and invite people, but we need to know what we believe. Because so often as Christians, we can say, yeah, we really believe this about this controversial issue. And the person says, oh, where does it say that in the Bible then? And we go, somewhere. I think this new year is perhaps an opportunity for us to recommit ourselves to the Word of God. And I'd like to suggest that we give up Bible reading. Give up Bible reading. And some of you are looking at me, Dave, somewhat nervously right now, wondering if there's a trap door that could cause me to disappear. Well, Bible reading is all right, but we're never really told to just read the Bible. We're told to feed on the Bible. I've been reflecting on Psalm 1, where it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it day and night. And the word meditate there is the Hebrew word hagar. And the word means, it points to a dog with a bone who is chewing away at the bone and then growling gently in pleasure. Let me illustrate that. Been practicing that all week. <laughs> you see, we're not just called to run our eyes over print, but to chew, to meditate, to groan with joy, if you like, at the revelation of God, to really feed on Scripture. And perhaps as I talk about listening to the whispers of God, it might be that this week God's going to whisper the name of somebody to us, a work colleague, someone in the road in which we live, for us to intentionally go to them and say, hey, why don't you just come and be with me at Kingsgate? You don't need to give them 10 paragraphs about what's going to happen. Just come and, and I'll meet you. In fact, let me drive you in my car. Get on the back of my bike, whatever. Come with me. Listen to the whispers of the Spirit. Well, the last thing is this. God cares. So thirdly, this is a time to heed the call to first love. The call to first love. Charles Wesley wrote this carol in the first year after he was converted. He was a brand new Christian when he wrote this. One writer says, the inspiration of this comes from his newly made contact with God. It was still fresh. Beautiful words from a brand new Christian. The word hark, hark the herald, it does mean listen, pay attention, but it also means to go back to something that was lost. And so harking 
is a word that was used when hunting dogs lost the scent and they had to retrace their steps in order to catch the scent again. We still sometimes talk about people who are always harking back, harking back to something. A couple of weeks ago, I woke up about 2 a.m. And it was one of those moments when I wasn't just not able to sleep, but I just had a sense that God had something to say to me. As a brand new Christian, I was pretty neurotic and uptight and some of my fears and nervousness were silly. I was paranoid about missing the will of God. It was all a bit crazy. But I felt like God whispered to me at 2 a.m., Jeff, I know some of it was crazy back then, but I love the way that you so wanted to please me. A few hours later, I got up and my Bible reading that morning was from Ephesians 5.10. Find out what pleases the Lord. And ever since, I've been harking back. And I'm continuing to do that, sobered by the words of Jesus. When he spoke in Revelation 2, you've forsaken the love you had at first. Do the things you did at first. And notice, Jesus doesn't say, does he, get the feelings you had at first. No, he says, do the things you did at first. And I don't want my first faith. It was confused and neurotic, but I'd love my first love. And so as I close, and in a few moments we're going to sing, I'd like us, not just now, but this week, I'd like to invite you to hark back with me and think, for example, what about my serving? I was so desperate to serve back then. I saw it as such a privilege. And since COVID, there's been a real challenge to churches around the globe, not just to have people come back, but to serve and volunteer because we spent two years in self-survival. What about my worship? Do I worship him sacrificially, gladly, joyfully, expressively? What about availability? I remember back then I said, Jesus, I'll, I'll go anywhere for you, anywhere. My life was placed before him. Am I? Am I still up for that? Harking back? What about my giving? It wasn't even a matter of discussion or hesitation. Just give, give, give. Financially support. What about my priorities? Is, is he first or and I don't say this as a crushing weight, but just as a nudge to us to consider. Do I want him to be first? What about my integrity, holiness? Have I gradually, have I given my life to Jesus and then gradually taken it back again? I invite us to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. The late, great Dallas Willard said, the greatest danger to the Christian church today is that of pitching its message too low. First love. But as I, as I close for the second time, Hark the Herald Angels, there's a missing verse. It was written in 1739, but in 1782, the Methodists revised their hymn book and there's a verse that's been lost for 240 years, but we're gonna sing it today. And it's a verse that speaks about giving all of ourselves to Christ. It's a verse that we can use as we ask the Holy Spirit to help us hark back this week. It's a verse that we could use if we wanna to come to Christ, make a decision to follow Him. I've modernized it slightly, but just so that you're familiar with it, when we come to it, 
Adam's likeness, Lord, if I stamp your image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in your love. Let us, you though lost, regain, you the life, the inner man, all of us to you impart. Formed in every believing heart. Hark, the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Stand with me if you're able. Let's sing.